issues that they had? Why, why was that not communicated to the Department of Children and Families here in Florida? Why did the sheriff's office on their multiple visits uh, to the shooter's home not recognize and not be able to share information with those other agencies about the level of threat that he, that he posed? And then finally, uh, something that's, at, that's out of our purview is uh, how did the FBI fail? And so it's a truly a systemic failure. We're looking okay. to create ways in that mental so health the, professionals can communicate along all of these lines. All right, but, but, but besides that, because mental health obviously is a big component of this, uh, what else can you be doing right now to make sure that schools are safe? Have you guys talked about we can allowing the teachers yes, uh, who, who are trained in firearms to yeah. be able to bring their, their gun to school as well? Well, we want, we want to do more than that. And so, yes, uh, part of our proposal will include in the hardening of schools, mm -hmm. having school marshals. That would be ah. teachers that hold a concealed weapons permit that would go through an extensive training that'd be carried out by local law enforcement and approved by local school boards. And of course, would be on a voluntary basis. Let me, let me ask you this. Does it have to be a teacher though? I mean, because I think about, you know, my sister went to school for teaching and I don't think she, you know, has, has ever shot a gun in her life. And, um, you know, if she wants to teach, she's there because she wants to teach. And then asking her to suddenly take on the protection of those students by learning how to shoot a firearm or having that responsibility, that's it's kind of a different job description. I mean, what if, what if you guys looked at having U.S. Marshals, actually having U.S. Marshals, actually having security officers all around that school, and you know, look, if you got a teacher that is skilled in that way and she or he uh, can help by, by also being a so-called marshal, maybe that works. But I, I just worry that you know, you're gonna turn a lot of people off from the profession um, if they don't have that background. Well, I, I think that I think that you're you're equating a the voluntary ability to do it if they so choose with a requirement for them mm -hmm. to do it. Uh, this is uh, not every teacher would be required to do this. In fact, none of them would. But I'm right, certain but that there are many teachers, including that say... brave coach that threw himself in front of those children. Right. I'm sure that he would have been willing to carry a firearm. Okay. I, it, but you're, you're also as a school, you're going to say, okay, well, we need X number of people that can carry firearms. So suddenly your job description becomes a little bit more. I mean, look, if, if you're skilled in firearms and you wanna carry one because you wanna protect yourself and your students, I understand that. I am sympathetic to that, I, I, I get it. But my concern here is that we're gonna have some kind of blanket rule where you have to have 10 teacher marshals in a particular school and suddenly well, your, your if, principal if, if that, and your school board is looking happen, for those that know how to shoot a gun as opposed to those who know how to teach kids. Uh, no, I, I think if that's going to happen, it'll be in another state. The legislation we're, we're putting together makes it entirely voluntary. And in addition to that, we already have at many of our schools a school resource officer. That's a, it's a, an officer from the police department uh, that serves at that school. We're going to double the, the number of those officers. Uh, but the real way and the, and the best way to create this protection, and some other states have it, is to have that option. It's just an option. I mean, we, we certainly option. do I'm just after saying, go, go a little further here. On airplanes. Take a little money. Spend a little money. This would be on the communities, I would think. Hire some police officers. You know, there, there are ways that you could protect a school where you don't put the burden entirely on the teaching population, but that, you know, you actually have law enforcement there. Well, I think I think our proposal has both, and so okay. so we have school resource officers, and then we have this option, and um, okay. and 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 I think that what you will see when when the plan rolls out okay. is that there is a huge okay. financial commitment to all of it. Yeah, no, I, it's it's a commitment we're going to have to make because unfortunately this is the world in which we now live. Representative, good luck with your proposal with your bill. Thank you very much for joining us today. New reaction today as President Trump comes face to face with the faces of anguish and with anger. Did he speak volumes? by not speaking at all. We gotta do something about this. We cannot have our children die. How many schools, how many children have to get shot? I'm never gonna see my kid again. I want you all to know that. Never ever will I see my kid. How do we not stop this after Columbine, after seven year olds can we allow to die? Just begging to, for a change. We need a change. We need to do something. And that's why we're here. So let's be strong for the fallen, 
who don't have a voice to speak anymore. And let's never let this happen again. Please. Please. Powerful. Very moving words there from students and parents impacted from school shootings. President Trump taking it all in, not saying a whole lot, just taking some time to listen to everyone. So did he speak volumes, really, by not speaking at all? We're asking GOP pollster Lee Carter. Lee, I mean, these people's stories, their anguish, their frustration. Um, there was a lot of raw emotion on display. And the president gave them that time. Mm -hmm. He enabled them to convey all of their concerns. And, and I guess I would ask you, didn't that say a lot? I mean, it, you don't necessarily have to be talking the whole time. And, you know, this is president <laughs> kind of likes to talk. Um, but he, he held back. Yeah. Was that valuable for him to do? I think it was so, so, so valuable. And one of the things that I think politicians and leaders often forget is one of the most powerful things you can do in a time of crisis, in a time of pain, in a time that's really hard for people is listen. Listening in and of itself is an action. Showing that you care, showing that you are open to hearing what's going on with them, to other sides, to other perspectives, that's extremely, extremely powerful. And he's not stopping by doing it last night, he's doing it again. And I think it's really wise because I don't think, as we've been talking about, this is an incredibly complex issue. This isn't just about schools, this isn't just about guns, this isn't just about any one thing, mental health, name through. This is very complicated. This is about families, human lives lives, young children, America's feeling safe to send their kids to school. This is the heart of who we are. And the president taking time to make this not about himself, but about those people who have been impacted so, so very personally was very, very smart for him. And then in the coming days and weeks when he talks about how he's going to act and respond based on what he's heard from these people and these moving testimonies from all of these families is going to be really, really important going forward. I've heard he's been pretty affected by these stories. I mean, I, I don't know how you wouldn't be. I, you know, it's, it's, we're sitting here and you just start to watch some of those things. You can almost get tears in your eyes just watching it on video. I can't imagine what it's like to be there in person. And he clearly was moved. And I think the fact that he's not just doing it once, that he's doing it again, and that he's not making this about himself. And this is a president who has been really accused of saying, making everything about himself rather than the American people. He has taken into power because he has heard people and he represents the pain that people have felt across the country before. And then now at this moment, I think he's doing the right thing and that's not something we can always say that he does so let me ask you this then I mean we've had school shootings before and nothing's changed mm. is this time different I think it has to be different I think that we have um, an explanation point on this one because there's been so many we had Las Vegas we have the school shootings the number of mass shootings that we're having in the country has gotten to a point that people across the board are saying this is not okay when you're looking at polls now you're saying 94 percent of Americans are saying we've got to do something about this gun problem that we've got that there is no reason that we should be having these mass shootings it's only six percent who say everything's fine so le legislators are going to have to figure this out they're going to have to do something Americans want us to do better and the time is now to act and you know the president is floating ideas a lot of people out there are criticizing his ideas saying arming the teachers that's not necessarily the best people are, are criticizing them saying now right now that they're not talking about banning certain types of weapons we don't know exactly what's going to happen yet but I think the idea that these conversations are happening that there's that's going right. to be actions that's the right thing and I don't think the answer is just any one thing I think it's got to be many I, things. I agree with you I mean whether you're talking about mental health and recognizing these problems before they actually happen whether you're talking about putting better background checks in so a crazy guy doesn't get access to a gun like this guy did um, or whether you're talking about arming teachers that want to be armed and maybe making sure that that schools have the ability to protect themselves by putting in some kind of I don't know US marshal system at every public school we got to do what we need to do to make sure that our children can go and learn in an environment where they feel safe 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely unconscionable that we wouldn't do something at this point. And it's not just because this is the one. It's because there have been so many that have led us here. And the voice of the students, by the way, uh, those brave students who have come forward and been able to speak at such a time of crisis, I think that has been so powerful because it's impossible yeah. to politicize the children. No, that was, that was pure emotion. I mean, some people had said to me, my goodness, those kids are great speakers. And it had nothing to do with speaking ability and everything to do with, I think, them taking that moment and realizing it was no longer about themselves and whether they're nervous getting up and speaking, et cetera. It's all about making sure that they can make a difference on behalf of their classmates. Um, so I think this time really is different. And it's not just because people have had it. I think it's also that you have a president who's willing to lead on this one. And yeah. I'm going to give him a plug for this because a lot of Republicans would not have dared to say anything that would get the NRA upset. But there he is talking about raising the age for when you can get a gun. Mm -hmm. Stronger background checks, getting rid of bump stocks, different times. Thank Very different Lee. times. Thank you. All right, we're going to be right. Another all-time high today. This coming with several cities lining up to give Amazon tax breaks for its new headquarters. Now, a political group backed by the billionaire Koch brothers are campaigning against those breaks, saying taxpayers and small businesses will end up footing the bill. Are they right? We're asking. Market watchers: Gary B. Smith. Keith Herzog and Heather Zumaraga. Gary B. They definitely, uh, Coke is right in this case. You know, I think the one figure that uh, Newark was offering was like in, in the billions, mm -hmm. four or five billion works out. 50,000 jobs, that works out to about 140,000 a job that they're paying Amazon. You know, it's foot in the bill, of course. It's the state of New Jersey. It's the city of Newark. It's a city that can't afford that much money. It's a city that will probably never see that much money returned to it. I think it's a horrible idea for the season. It's, to it's do that. corporate welfare, right? I mean, that's exactly. what they're saying. And especially for a company like Amazon that hardly that needs it. It doesn't really need it. <laughs> you know, look, Heath, if they were going to say, we're going to make a more attractive environment for Amazon. I mean, my home state of New Hampshire was trying to get Amazon there, too. I don't know as they could have competed with the likes of what Newark was offering. But if they said, okay, look, we are going to offer incentives that every business can get, then that seems to me to be a little bit more fair. I mean, you know that GE left Connecticut for Massachusetts because there was a more attractive tax rate. So if you want to, say, create a more favorable environment for business, isn't it only right that you do it for everyone? Right. We can't just look at the top earners over here. I mean, yes, Amazon is doing well. We're looking at the stock price. It's hitting highs that I can't even believe I'm seeing in my lifetime. However, the bread and butter of this country are the small business owners. So to your point, yes, we probably do need to have these tax incentives for these small businesses. And Newark, for example, is offering a $7 billion right. Right. Tax incentive. I mean, Newark was but just having for Amazon. This is just for Amazon, <laughs> exactly. Just for Maryland offering a five billion dollar tax incentive. We're talking about state economies that were really having issues. I mean, California as well. We're looking. The, the, if you look at the states that are on the list of potential and cities that are on the potential um, places for HQ, these are states that have been torn apart by uh, by uh, economy economic issues for the last five to ten years. Yeah, no, I get it. Heather, they all want Amazon to come there because that means jobs. That means more money for the state. But in the interest of total fairness, it really seems to me that if you're going to you know, change the rules for one player, you should be willing to change them for all and not just say we're going to cherry pick who we want. In this case, Amazon, big fat corporation that already has enough money. Yeah, you're right. This is a legitimate thing that any town would want. Um, unfortunately, I believe this is crony capitalism. This is corporate welfare. Amazon, who raked in $175 billion last year, should not be receiving any type of local government incentive or subsidy in the form of uh, taxation, state and local taxes, or writing off 100% of their property taxes, like in the case of Ohio. I just don't think that's fair to other small businesses, not to mention their predatory pricing practices that will also put small businesses, uh, make them bankrupt, put I'm them gonna, out of business. I, I'm going to differ with the two ladies here in one, in one regard. I don't mind the crony capitalism, if you will. Cities do things they can to attract 
different businesses, just like uh, sports teams try to attract different athletes. My issue, though, not at the expense of taxpayer issue, though, dollars. My, hold on. My issue, though, is like when cities build sports stadiums mm -hmm. on the back of the taxpayers that never return economically. That's my issue. And that's exactly if, the sure. point here. When you sit there and have, right, but I don't mind of, them. I don't mind when them. You have these type of stadiums built well, exactly like exactly, Amazon. Exactly, but I don't mind that they're going after anything. Amazon. I am mind the amount of money that they're going after Amazon with. If it was like, oh, we okay. could spend a million to get Amazon, I would say, and, go ahead. And what's worse, well, though, Gary, really, is that I mean, it's a million dollars that you're not giving to another business, Gary. I mean, but but, no, but my be... point is they will return more than a million dollars oh, okay, economically. That, that's okay. it, yes. Is it worth it in terms of right. incentives? But, I, you know, look, I, I say there's nothing wrong with states being as competitive as possible, but let's make it fair. Let's just make it really, really fair. Uh, final word over to Heather. Uh, is it fair? I guess what's worse is that it's not disclosed. A lot of the states have kept it mm. secret. So for the people to decide, you and I and Gary and Heatha, we can't decide <laughs> if it worked out and if it was fair if the states don't disclose exactly what incentives they're giving big corporations like Amazon. That point. is true. Hey, it's good to see you all. By the way, I don't think I've ever seen Gary B in person. Uh, <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Good stuff. All right, we're moving on to the tax cut tussle. Vice President Mike Pence taking on House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi over her crumbs comment. Now is a new poll by a former Clinton strategist showing Pelosi might be eating her words. In terms of the bonus that corporate America received versus the crumbs that they are giving to workers to kind of put the schmooze on is so pathetic. Any leader who says that a thousand dollars in the pockets of working families is crumbs is out of touch with the American people. I wonder if she's regretting that comment. A new poll today could be proving that Vice President Mike Pence is right. According to Harvard Harris, this is a poll, voters are warming to the Republican tax cuts and that's helping the president's numbers. Let's go to the man behind those numbers right now, Mr. Mark Penn, former Clinton strategist and co-director of Harvard Caps Harris. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. So uh, were you surprised by this? Uh, in the last two months, we've seen people's attitudes towards the economy really tick up significantly. I mean, we've got 70% who think the economy's in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say, hey, only 30% say they're getting a tax cut, but I think they see the tax cut as part of a policy for the economy that is working. Okay, and uh, what is that gonna mean for Democrats? I mean, if the economy's improving, wages are growing, GDP is growing, the stock market's up, does it make it harder to uh, say stomach comments like, you know, these bonuses are just crumbs? Well, look, the uh, what we call the generic horse rates between Democrats and Republicans has closed to about five points in, in mm -hmm. our poll. I think the Democrats did incredibly well on health care. Uh, I think, frankly, uh, tax cuts were a swing and a miss. Uh, probably a lot of Democrats and Republican states should have voted for them, as, I, as I've been consistently clear. Uh, and we'll see what happens with immigration, which is the next big issue. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if you had to handicap it right now, just in terms of the economy, it looks like, you know, missing out on the opportunity to give Americans a little bit more of what they actually earn was, in fact, a big political mistake. Uh, I think support has built from the mid-30s to around 50%. We have it at about 48. New York Times had it at 51. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the tax cut is, is a popular item. The moving economy is a popular item. But... You know, the president's ratings are at about 40, so there's other, his personal ratings are about 40, so there's other factors here as well. Mm -hmm. But there's no question that this tax cut and this economy has given people more confidence in Republicans over Democrats, but Democrats still have an edge so far this year. You know, it, it, it's amazing to me that they allowed, in some ways, their thunder to be stolen by this president. I mean, they used to be about the working class, the middle class. And increasingly they got away from that and they were about um, perhaps an underclass that is not participating in the economy. So they're trying to take from the middle class and the upper middle class and redistribute that money to the people that aren't working. 
And as such, Mark, I, I, I think they've kind of lost that working American. I mean, this is one of the reasons why places like Pennsylvania were such a challenge for Hillary Clinton. What would be your advice to any Democrat running right now for 2018?